Think Like a Monk Introduction In Think Like a Monk, author and former monk Jay Shetty shares the wisdom he gained during his time as a monk and how it can be applied to modern life. Through his experiences and teachings, he offers practical advice on how to cultivate a monk mindset and live a more fulfilling life. Monks have long been known for their ability to find peace, calm, and purpose in their lives. They have a unique perspective on the world and a way of thinking that allows them to live in harmony with themselves and the world around them. But becoming a monk is not just for those who choose to live a monastic lifestyle. Anyone can adopt the mindset of a monk and incorporate their teachings into their daily lives. In fact, many famous people throughout history have embraced the monk-like mindset, including business leaders, artists, and athletes. And recent scientific research has supported the benefits of mindfulness, meditation, and other practices taught by monks. By studying monk philosophy, one can learn about forgiveness, energy, intentions, living with purpose, and other topics that are as relevant today as they were thousands of years ago. The most important lesson, perhaps, is to focus on the root of things, rather than getting caught up in surface-level concerns. One of the first things monks learn is how to breathe, as the breath is the one constant throughout our lives that never changes. By learning to focus on the breath and live in the present moment, we can find greater peace and clarity in our lives. In con conclusion, the mindset of a monk is not just for those who live in monasteries, but for anyone seeking greater peace, calm, and purpose in their lives. By adopting the teachings of the monks, we can learn to focus on the root of things and live more mindfully in the present moment. Part 1, Letting Go Chapter 1, Identity, I am what I think I am The way we perceive ourselves is heavily influenced by what we think others think of us. Our values, which serve as an ethical GPS to navigate through life, are also shaped by our experiences during childhood. The media plays a significant role in influencing our values and beliefs, and we need space, silence, and stillness to build self-awareness. To actively create space for reflection, we can sit down daily to reflect on our emotions, explore new environments to learn about ourselves, and get involved in something that's meaningful to us. Auditing our time and discretionary spending can help us determine the values that shape our lives. Higher values such as fearlessness, purity of mind, gratitude, and compassion elevate and propel us towards happiness, fulfillment, and meaning. Lower values, on the other hand, can demote us towards anxiety, depression, and suffering. By looking at our best and worst choices and analyzing the values behind them, we can make conscious choices about what matters to us and how much energy we devote to it. Once we filter out opinions, expectations, and obligations, we can invite the world back in. Studies show that both happiness and depression spread within social circles, and who we surround ourselves with can help us stick to our values and achieve our goals. We can conduct a companion audit by listing the people we spend the most time with and the values we share with them. Chapter 2, Negativity Negativity often stems from a threat to our core emotional needs, namely peace, love, and understand understanding. Chronic negativity can harm our physical health, and it is contagious. We tend to have an instinct towards agreement with others, and monks lead with awareness, taking a step back to remove themselves from the emotional charge of the moment. Detachment helps us find understanding without judgment, and we should always strive to help others without harming them. The 25,75 principle recommends that for every negative person, we should have three uplifting ones. Surrounding ourselves with people who are better than us in some way, happier, or more spiritual can help us grow and learn. A community is a place where people serve and inspire each other, and the desire to save others and give advice is ego-driven. We should find our significance from being the person we want to be, rather than thinking others have it better. We should also learn to take sympathetic joy in the good fortune of others, as this expands our own joy and happiness. We must be careful of negative projections and suspicions, as they reflect our insecurities and get in our way. It is crucial to clean the ecology and purify our hearts to contribute great purity to the world around us. We can audit our negative comments and try to reduce them to zero. By finding joy in the success of our friends and family, we can experience unlimited joy in the theater of joy. To combat the toxicity in the world, we must purify our own hearts and inspire others to do the same. We can list five people we care about but feel competitive with and identify at least one reason for our envy. 
By visualizing how their achievements have benefited them, we can learn to take joy in their success. Chapter 3, Fear, Welcome to Hotel Earth. Fear does not prevent death, it prevents life. Buddha. Fear is a powerful emotion that can hold us back from living our lives to the fullest. It is a natural response to perceived threats and danger, but it can also be an obstacle to growth and change. Therefore, it is important to recognize our reaction pattern to fear and learn how to reprogram it. Pain is one of the ways that our body and mind signal that something needs attention. In the same way, fear is a signal that something is amiss or threatening. To understand our relationship with fear, we can start by rating something that is truly scary to us on a scale of 1 to 10. The next time we feel fear, we can compare it to that 10 and see how it measures up. This exercise helps us understand the intensity of our fear and puts it into perspective. Attachment is the cause of fear. When we cling to temporary things, they gain power over us and become a source of pain and fear. However, when we accept the temporary nature of everything in our lives, we can feel gratitude for the good fortune of borrowing them for a time. When we accept that we don't truly own or control anything, we can value people, things, and experiences more and be more thoughtful about what we choose to include in our lives. One of the key lessons that monks teach is not to judge the moment. This means accepting whatever is happening in the present moment without labeling it as good or bad. We can use our breath to control our emotions by slowing down our heart rate. The 4 second breathing technique, 4 seconds inhale, 4 seconds exhale, can be an effective way to do this. It is also important to celebrate our past challenges that led us to our current successes in life. We need to reprogram our view of fear from something that is inherently negative to a neutral signal or even an indicator of opportunity. Chapter 4, Intention, Blinded by the Goal. There are four fundamental motivations in life, fear, fear, desire, duty, and love. As long as we attach our happiness to external events that are ever-changing, we will always be left waiting for it. Despite rising incomes in the U.S., happiness has fallen due to social factors such as declining trust in the government and weaker social networks. Life isn't always positive, but it's always possible to find meaning. Purpose and meaning, not success, lead to true contentment. Understanding this makes us see the importance of being motivated by duty and love. It's essential to pause and reflect not only on why we want something, but also who we need to be to get it and whether being that person appeals to us. Being honest about our intentions is crucial. It's okay if we recognize that our motivations are fear or desire. Eventually, we'll discover that fulfillment can't be found through those motivations. An exercise to help us understand our intentions is to take a desire we have and ask ourselves why we want it. Keep asking until we get to the root intention. We shouldn't negate intentions that aren't good. We need to recognize that if it isn't love, growth, or knowledge, the opportunity may fulfill important practical needs, but it won't feel emotionally meaningful. We should define ourselves by our intentions, not our achievements or careers. If we do, and we lose a job or achievement, we lose our identity. The focus should be on the process, not the outcome. Satisfaction comes from believing in the value of what we do. An exercise to help us achieve this is to add to be's next to our to-dos. This reminds us that achieving our goals with intention means living up to. Chapter Meditation is an ancient practice that has been used for thousands of years to promote relaxation, mindfulness, mindfulness, and spiritual growth. It involves training the mind to focus and achieve a state of calmness and clarity. Meditation has been shown to have numerous physical and mental health benefits, including reducing stress and anxiety, improving sleep, and increasing focus and productivity. One of the most fundamental aspects of meditation is breathwork. Focusing on the breath is a powerful tool for calming the mind and promoting relaxation. The monks who taught the protagonist in the above chapter of meditation describe it as cleaning your heart. This is because when we take the time to focus on our breath and clear our minds, we are better able to connect with ourselves and become more aware of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. In this chapter, the protagonist is taught several different breathwork exercises that can be used for different purposes, including calming and relaxation, energy and focus, and sleep. These exercises involve breathing in a particular pattern while focusing on different aspects of the breath, 
such as the expansion and contraction of the stomach. One of the keys to successful breath work is to find a comfortable position to sit or lie down in. It's important to be relaxed and at ease so that you can fully focus on your breath. Once you're comfortable, close your eyes and lower your gaze and begin to bring your awareness to calmness, balance, ease, stillness, and peace. If your mind wanders, gently and softly bring it back to these qualities. Next, become aware of your natural breathing pattern. Don't force or pressure your breath in any way. Instead, just observe your breath as it naturally flows in and out. Diaphragmatic breathing, which involves inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the mouth while focusing on the expansion and contraction of the stomach, is a particularly effective technique for calming the mind and, and promoting relaxation. When you inhale, focus on taking in positive, uplifting energy. When you exhale, imagine that you are releasing any negative, toxic energy. This helps to promote a sense of balance and harmony within the body and mind. The protagonist is also taught a few specific breathwork exercises that can be used for different purposes. The first exercise is for calming and relaxation. To do this exercise, breathe in through your nose for a count of four, hold for a count of four, and then exhale through your mouth for a count of four. Repeat this pattern for 10 reps. The second exercise is for energy and focus. To do this exercise, breathe in through your nose for a count of four, and then exhale powerfully through your nose for less than a count. Repeat this pattern for 10 reps. The final exercise is for sleep. To do this exercise, breathe in for a count of four, and then exhale for a longer period than four counts. Repeat this pattern until you are asleep or feel close to sleep. Part 2, Grow. Chapter 5. Finding your purpose, embracing the nature of the scorpion. The scorpion philosophy teaches that society is like the organs of a body, and that no one organ is more important than another. All of them must work together in harmony for the body to function properly. Similarly, we must have flexibility in order to access every corner of study and growth. Dharma, or living in your purpose, is the key to finding fulfillment in life. It is a combination of Varna, Varna, which refers to our passion and skills, and Seva, which involves understanding the world's needs and selflessly serving others. When we feel passion during a process that is pleasing, our execution is skillful, and we receive positive feedback, it shows that our passion has a purpose. Therefore, Dharma is the combination of passion, expertise, and usefulness. There are two lies that we often hear while growing up, you never amount to anything and you can be anything you want to be. The truth is that we cannot be anything we want, but we can be everything we are. A monk is a traveler, and the journey is inward, bringing us ever closer to our most authentic, confident, and powerful self. By paying attention, cultivating self-awareness, and feeding our strengths, we can discover our dharma and pursue it. In his book Open, Andre Agassi admitted that he hated tennis, even despite the fame and fortune. Eventually, he started to live his true calling by serving others and helping at-risk youth. We cannot and should not do everything. Our limitations create space for the gifts of other people. Instead of focusing on our weaknesses, we should lean into our strengths and look for ways to make them central in our lives. It is important to experiment broadly before rejecting options, and much of this experimentation is done in school and elsewhere when we are young. The quadrants of potential is a model that considers both skill and passion. The top right quadrant is where our passions and skills align, while the bottom left is where we lack both. Many times, we work on things we are good at but do not love, and then use our spare time to work on things we love but are not good, good at because we do not spend enough time developing them. We should look for opportunities to do what we love in the life we already have, as we never know where it might lead. We can also learn to love what we are good at by reframing our perspective and finding meaning or purpose in what we do. There are four personality types, or varnas, and no hierarchy among them. All are necessary and equal. The guide is compelled to learn and share knowledge and is suited for professions like teaching and writing. The leader likes to influence and provide and is suited for positions like CEO, lieutenant, school principal, or shop manager. The creator likes to make things happen and is suited for positions in startups or neighborhood associations. 
Finally, the maker likes to see things tangibly built and is suited for positions like coders, nurses, and other professions that involve inventing, supporting, and implementing. Creatives are merchants, business people, marketers, salespeople, entertainers, producers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs. They are skilled at brainstorming, networking, innovating, making things happen, and can convince themselves and others of anything. They are highly driven by money, pleasure, and success, hardworking, determined, and always on the move. They excel at trade, commerce, and banking and work hard and play hard. Makers were originally artists, musicians, creatives, and writers, but today, they are social workers, therapists, doctors, nurses, CEOs, heads of HR, artists, musicians, engineers. Chapter 6, Routine, Location has energy, time has memory. In today's world, most people start their day by checking their phones, and the first thing they experience is stress, pressure, and anxiety. This can set the tone for the rest of the day, making it difficult to stay motivated and focused. To make life more me meaningful, we need to start our day with a positive mindset, which can be achieved by waking up early and following a routine that includes activities like thankfulness, insight, meditation, and exercise. In this chapter, we will explore how routine, location, and time impact our lives and offer tips on how to make the most of them. Waking up to an alarm clock and checking our phones first thing in the morning immediately overwhelms us with stress, pressure, and anxiety. To avoid this, it is recommended to wake up an hour earlier than usual. The energy and mood of the morning carry through the day, so making life more meaningful begins there. However, it's crucial to sleep early enough to get a full night's rest. The morning is defined by the evening, so establishing a healthy, restful evening routine can set the momentum for the morning. Writing down three things you want to achieve the next morning during your evening routine and finding your version of a monk's robe, a uniform you put on in the morning that gives a different energy than your relaxation clothes, can be helpful in establishing a routine. Removing challenges and simplifying decisions throughout the day can reserve your energy for more important things. The emotion you fall asleep with at night is most likely the emotion you'll wake up with in the morning. Truly noticing what's around us keeps our brain from shifting into autopilot. Routine frees your mind, but the biggest threat to that freedom is monotony. As Kobe Bryant said on the On Purpose podcast, a lot of the time, creativity comes from structure. When you have those parameters and structure, then within that, you can be creative. Structure enhances spontaneity, and discovery reinvigorates the routine. Visualizing yourself as your best self in the morning, healthy, well-rested, energized, energized, and going through your morning routine mindfully can help in achieving that ideal state. Visualization doesn't change your life, but it changes how you see it. Life won't go how you visualize, but you can return and realign it to the ideal you imagine. Exercise, look for something new in a routine that you already have. What can you see on your commute that you've never seen? Try starting a conversation with someone you see regularly but haven't ever engaged. Do this with one new person every day and see how your life changes. Changing up your routine or physical environment can also be helpful in breaking the monotony. Location has energy, and every location has a specific energy that can affect our mood, productivity, and success. Your dharma thrives or falters in specific environments. For every environment you spend time in, ask yourself these questions right after, and then again at the end of the week. What were the key features of the space? How did I feel in this space? Did the activity I was doing fit well in the place I was doing it? The more your personal spaces are devoted to single, clear purposes, the better they will serve you. Not just in the fulfillment of your dharma, but in your mood and productivity. Sound design your life and choose ringtones, podcasts, and music that uplift you and make you feel happier. Doing something at the same time every day helps us remember to do it. Slotting a new habit into the same time every day or linking the new practice to an existing habit can make it easier to remember. Chapter 7, The Mind, The Charioteer's Dilemma. The mind is a complex entity that constantly predicts what is going to happen next, and understanding its intricacies is crucial for personal growth. By visualizing the mind as a separate entity, we can work on our relationship with it and improve the quality of our interaction. The charioteer metaphor illustrates this relationship, 
with the chariot representing the body and the five horses representing the five senses that need to be calmed and reined in. The monkey mind is reactive, while the monk mind is proactive, so it is essential to remove physical and mental triggers to cultivate a more proactive mindset. To achieve this, it is helpful to write down all the noise in your mind on a daily basis and identify self-defeating messages. Talking to yourself out loud can help overwrite these negative voices and boost memory and focus. Reframing self-criticism in terms of knowledge and encouraging oneself as one would a child can also be effective strategies. Three routes to happiness are learning, progressing, and achieving, and identifying progress can help cultivate a sense of appreciation and motivation. Rather than amplifying failures, it is helpful to reframe self-criticism and put a solution-oriented spin on statements. Understanding deep pain can also help keep smaller disruptions in perspective, and practicing self-compassion involves observing feelings without judging them. Detachment is another key aspect of controlling the mind, and it involves being close to everything without letting it consume and own you. Fasting and other austerities can help us overcome the demands of the senses with self-control and resolve. Identifying when you experience attachment and developing strategies to swap in new behavior can also help cultivate detachment. Overall, the mind is the key to translating the outside world into happiness or misery, and understanding its workings is crucial for personal growth and happiness. Chapter 8, Ego, Catch Me If You Can Ego is an important topic in the world of self-improvement, self as it can often prevent individuals from seeing their true potential and growth opportunities. This chapter explores the nature of ego and how it creates false hierarchies, desires respect, and creates obstacles to growth. It also discusses the importance of humility, detaching from personal situations, and receiving feedback productively. The ego wants to be seen as better and creates false hierarchies, which can lead to arrogance and the desire for respect. However, the humble worker inspires respect through their actions, not their words. The nature of judgment almost always backfires on us in one way or another. When we criticize others for failing to live up to higher standards, we ourselves are failing to live up to those standards. Usually, criticism is a way to distract ourselves from our own insecurities and weaknesses. Projection is the psychological term for our tendency to project onto others emotions or feelings we don't wish to deal with ourselves. The ego is the obstacle to growth. If we aren't open-minded, we deny ourselves opportunities to learn, grow, and change. You can only keep up the myth of your own importance for so long. If you don't break your ego, life will break it for you. Humility is the elixir of the ego. One can practice humility by doing simple work and menial tasks that don't place any participant at the center of attention. To restrain our ego and increase gratitude, there are two things to remember and two things to forget. It is important to remember the bad we've done to others and the good others have done for us. It is equally important to forget the good we've done for others and the bad others have done to us. This helps us detach from situations and realize that all we've accomplished has been with the help of others. Don't take everything others do personally. It is usually not about you. The chapter includes an exercise on transforming the ego. The exercise encourages individuals to detach from their ego and put forth a thoughtful, productive response. For example, when receiving an insult, one should take a broader perspective and respond to the situation. When receiving a compliment or accolades, one should use the opportunity to be grateful for the help they've received. When arguing with a partner, the desire to be right or win comes from the ego's unwillingness to admit weakness, it is important to see the other side. When topping people, one should listen to understand and acknowledge. The chapter concludes with the idea that confidence and high self-esteem help individuals accept themselves as they are humble, imperfect, and striving. Real greatness is achieved when one uses their own achievements to teach others, and they learn to teach others, expanding the greatness accomplished exponentially. Thinking of the role you play in other people's lives as the most valuable currency is a great way to overcome the ego. People who have it all derive the greatest satisfaction from service. The chapter also includes a meditation technique for visualization. Visualization is important because whatever can be built internally can be built externally. The technique involves choosing positive visualizations and focusing on them. 
The chapter concludes by reminding readers that overcoming the ego is a practice, not an accomplishment. Part 3, Give. Chapter 9, Gratitude, the world's most powerful drug. Gratitude is a powerful emotion that can transform our lives. When we start our day with gratitude, we open ourselves up to opportunities instead, instead of obstacles. Gratitude becomes a habit, and we start looking for more things to be grateful for. In this chapter, we will discuss various exercises and practices to develop gratitude and experience its transformative power. Exercise, keep a gratitude journal. One of the easiest ways to develop gratitude is to keep a gratitude journal. Every night, take five minutes to write down things you are grateful for. It can be as simple as having a roof over your head, good health, or a loving family. Keeping a gratitude journal helps us focus on the positive aspects of our lives and helps us develop an attitude of gratitude. You can also track how you sleep before and after this experiment. Gratitude has been shown to improve sleep quality, and tracking your sleep can help you see the benefits of practicing gratitude. We are often in the habit of thinking that we do not deserve misfortune, but we do deserve whatever blessings have come our way. Practicing gratitude helps us appreciate the good things in our lives and recognize the role of luck and circumstances in our successes. Exercise Everyday Gratitude Practices Morning gratitude, as soon as you wake up, flip over on your stomach, put your hands in prayer and bow your head. Then, think of whatever is good in your life. This simple exercise can set a positive tone for the day and help you focus on the good things in your life. Meal gratitude, take one meal a day and commit to taking a moment to be thankful for the food. This can be as simple as saying a quick prayer or silently thanking the people involved in preparing the meal. This practice helps us appreciate the simple things in life and develop a sense of gratitude for the things we often take for granted. Exercise, Gratitude Meditations Grati Gratitude meditations are a powerful way to develop gratitude. After sitting, relaxing, and doing breath work, say the phrase I am grateful for underscore and complete it with as many things as you can. You can also reframe negativities by finding elements of them for which you are grateful. Joy visualization. During meditation, take yourself to a time and place where you experience joy and allow that feeling to re-enter you. This exercise helps us relive positive experiences and develop a sense of gratitude for them. Build your gratitude like a muscle now so that it will strengthen over time. Do not judge the moment. As soon as you label something as bad, your mind starts to believe it. Be grateful for setbacks and allow the journey of life to progress in its own time and way. Ask yourself, what's the opportunity in the moment? Exercise, gratitude in hindsight. Think of something you were not grateful for when it first happened. Now, consider in what way this experience is worthy of your gratitude. This exercise helps us develop a sense of gratitude for the things that did not seem positive at first. Think of something unpleasant going on now or that you anticipate and experiment with anticipating gratitude for an unlikely recipient. This exercise helps us develop empathy and compassion for others and helps us appreciate the positive aspects of challenging situations. Express your gratitude specifically to others. Gratitude and joy come from the feeling that someone else is invested in you. It's a feedback loop of love. Kindness and gratitude are symbiotic and Buddhist teaching suggests that kindness and gratitude must be developed together, working in harmony. harmony. Kindness is as easy and hard as this, genuinely wanting something good for someone else, thinking about what would benefit them, and putting effort into giving them that benefit. Your own acts of kindness teach you what it takes. Chapter 10, Relationships, People Watching. Human beings are social animals that thrive on connection and relationships. In recent years, researchers have shown that social connections play a crucial role in overall health and longevity. According to research, the quality of our relationships, community involvement, and social behaviors are among the key factors that contribute to our health and well-being. In this chapter, the author emphasizes the importance of close relationships with family, a tribe with shared beliefs, and healthy social behaviors. Additionally, he highlights the importance of developing trust in relationships, setting realistic expectations, and showing love through various loving exchanges. Close Relationships with Family 
Family is the first social network that we encounter in life. Family members are usually the first people we develop a close relationship with, and these relationships are crucial for our emotional well-being. According to research, people who have close relationships with their family members have lower rates of depression and anxiety, experience less stress, and have a higher quality of life. Moreover, having a supportive family network can also help us deal with challenging situations in life and increase our resilience. A tribe with shared beliefs. Belonging to a community or tribe with shared beliefs is another essential factor that contributes to our well-being. Being part of a community where we feel a sense of belonging and connection, connection helps us feel supported, valued, and understood. According to research, people who have a sense of community involvement have lower rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Furthermore, being part of a community with shared beliefs can help us develop a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Healthy Social Behaviors Our social behaviors also play a crucial role in our overall well-being. Having healthy social behaviors such as positive communication, empathy, and kindness can help us build stronger relationships with others. Moreover, research has shown that people who engage in healthy social behaviors have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and stroke. Developing trust in relationships. Trust is a crucial component of any relationship. According to the author, there are four characteristics of trust that we look for in the people we allow into our lives, competence, care, character, and consistency. Competence refers to having the right skills and experience to be listened to. Care refers to people who think about what's best for you, not them. Character refers to having a strong moral compass and uncompromising values. And consistency refers to being reliable, present, and available when you need them. Setting realistic expectations. The author emphasizes the importance of setting realistic expectations in relationships. Sometimes, we expect love in return from the person we give it, but we fail to return the love others give us. Therefore, it is crucial to set realistic expectations and first think about what value we can offer others. Chapter 11 This chapter focuses on the importance of service and selflessness in finding inner peace and leading a meaningful life. The author highlights how service is good for the body and soul, and that studies show people who help others tend to live longer, be healthier, and have a better sense of well-being. The chapter begins with a quote, the ignorant work for their own profit. The wise work for the welfare of the world, world, which sets the tone for the discussion on the importance of service. The author highlights that the highest purpose is to live in service, and that selflessness is the surest route to inner peace and a meaningful life. Furthermore, the author suggests that selflessness can heal the self. The author argues that we are born wired to care for others, and that distractions from the external world make us forget our purpose. Therefore, it is important to reconnect with that instinct to find meaning in life. The author also points out that service gives back to us, and that it is a reciprocal exchange. The act of giving is an exchange of love that benefits both the giver and receiver. In addition to discussing the benefits of service, the author provides practical exercises for readers to incorporate service into their lives. For example, readers are encouraged to extend their radius of care by thinking of 4 to 6 people they would drop everything to help and 20 people they would help in a small community. The author suggests writing down this list and displaying it to think of these people more often. The chapter also emphasizes the importance of serving within your dharma which means finding ways to serve through what you are already doing. The author suggests that readers find ways to connect what they already do to a higher purpose. Towards the end of the chapter, the author discusses the benefits of chanting and meditation. The author recommends adding a mantra to morning or evening meditation practice, which can change the way you speak to the universe. The author also suggests using the classic Aum chant, which has been shown to have health benefits. The chapter concludes with the author emphasizing the importance of daily practice, which includes breathwork, visualization, and chanting. The author provides a practical exercise for each practice and recommends starting with 21 minutes a day, using a timer to give oneself 7 minutes each for breathwork, visualization, and mantra. In conclusion, the author encourages readers to incorporate service into their lives to find inner peace and a meaningful life. The author suggests that selflessness is a reciprocal exchange that benefits both the giver and the receiver. 
By finding ways to serve within your dharma and incorporating daily practice, readers can experience the joy of service and find a sense of purpose in life. Closing In conclusion, Think Like a Monk is a thought-provoking and inspiring book that provides valuable insights into how to live a more mindful, purposeful life. By incorporating the teachings and practices of monks into a modern context, Jay Shetty offers a unique perspective on personal growth and self-discovery. Whether you are looking to improve your relationships, find your passion, or simply live a more peaceful and meaningful life, this book provides actionable steps and guidance to help you on your journey.